Imagine what it's like to be asked to find a cure for a fatal disease. First, you have to find the cause, and then you have to fix it. I'm going to tell you today some stories about patients for whom that was true. A, a cure for a human disease was obtained, and about a couple of patients who at least have a chance for that, and then I'm going to tell you about a couple of kids who never had a chance. I'm going to tell you about what's possible and what's impossible, and I'm going to ask you to help me to change the impossible into the possible, just as Doc said. This begins with a story that was really traditionally handled by medicine about cystinosis, a rare disease in which the amino acid cystine is stored within the compartments of cells so it can't get out because of a genetic defect. Consequently, crystals form, and those crystals destroy the tissue, destroys the kidneys by 10 years of age, destroys other organs of the body, a fatal disease in the 50s and 60s. You never wanted to make this diagnosis. But there is a treatment for this, and it's called cysteamine, a small molecule that promotes normal growth. And the way it does this is by getting into those compartments of the cells, called the lysosome, and lowering the cysteine content there, and then making the cells uh, live and, and be uh, fruitful, so to speak. The, it preserves the kidneys of these individuals, and it prevents the non-renal complications, which are often fatal. It turns out that if you put the cysteamine into eye drops, it furthermore <clears throat> will dissolve those crystals and clarify the cornea and reduce the photophobia or pain in the eyes of these individuals. You can see this here, too. The haziness has been clarified in a 20-year-old with cystinosis. As a consequence, this disorder has turned around, has been turned around by this uh, treatment. And this young fellow, who's from Central Texas, his name is Mason, he's a good student, takes his medicine, plays baseball, is expected to grow up to be a normal citizen of the United States contributing, he comes from a wonderful family, and with any luck, will turn out to be a cowboy. <laughs> now, that's a case of the traditional handling of a disease <clears throat> in which genetics did not play a huge role. And in fact, it took decades to handle this. But it turns out that Mason had a great advantage. He had a diagnosis. And there are tens of thousands of individuals around the country who do not have that advantage. They don't have a diagnosis. So the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, established an undiagnosed diseases program. <clears throat> and this program has added, as its goal to try to find the diagnosis in patients who've long sought one and have been unable to have one. And also to find out new diseases so that we can make new discoveries. It turns out that there are uh, over 5,000 applicants to this and 1,800 individual charts that are this big. And we've accepted over 400 individuals and seen over 300 of them and made 50 or 60 diagnoses of really rare diseases. We have the advantage in this of having access to the experts at the NIH Clinical Center, which is the largest clinical research hospital in the world. In addition, we're able to use the Human Genome Project, which annotates the 3.2 billion bases that we have and tells us where genes are. And we have very modern genetic techniques. So let me tell you something about some of these individuals. There was a family of five, and they're adults. They have trouble walking. It hurts them when they walk, and it hurts them because they're not getting enough blood supply. This is a normal a knee, and this is a knee of an individual in this family. In addition to the bones, this person has calcification of the arteries, and that's what impedes the movement of blood down into the feet. So we were able to use our sophisticated techniques. In this case, it's called a million SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism array to determine where along that entire 3.2 billion bases there's a region of difference in these five siblings compared, who were affected with this compared to their adult parents who were not affected. And this was the only region. It contained 92 genes, and one of those genes was mutated. We were able to find that. And that gene encoded a protein, which was an enzyme that produced a molecule called adenosine, within the vascular cells. And what this demonstrated to us was <clears throat> that adenosine is important for the prevention of calcification of those vessels. 
In addition, it allowed us to develop a treatment for these individuals, which in this case involves bisphosphonates, which you may remember if Sally Field has ever entered your home as Boniva. <laughs> And this, none of this would have happened without the undiagnosed disease program and these diagnoses. Now, here's another example. A 52-year-old woman who has this musculature that developed over the last four or five years. She's weak, though. It, it, it doesn't feel good. She has uh, not only no strength, but it's irrit irritating. And uh, <clears throat> so we were able to do a muscle biopsy at the NIH. She's part of the undiagnosed disease program and found that within the vessels of her muscle, she has amyloid, the accumulation of a protein. We next did a bone marrow to determine what, where the uh, protein might be coming from. And it turns out it was coming from plasma cells. She had multiple myeloma, which you re may remember has just recently taken the life of Geraldine Ferraro. <clears throat> and because of this diagnosis, we were able to refer her to the Mayo Clinic, where she had a stem cell bone marrow transplant. And she's now doing uh, extremely well. And she writes me every few months. So let me read to you what she wrote me a few months ago. Today is Buddy's birthday. That's her husband. I'm making his cake. I can stand long enough, and my arms are strong enough that I can this year. After a while, I'm going to run out to the mall and pick up a few more things. I'm confident that no matter what the parking situation is, I can walk in from the parking lot, walk through the stores long enough to get some things and pay for them, <clears throat> and walk back out and exercise and be strong enough to fix dinner and enjoy the family while we celebrate this evening. Last night, I held Ellie and Alana, my granddaughters, on my lap and read them a story. I'm able to do those things. Words can't express how grateful I am. We also have a five-year-old boy who has problems with his feet and with his um, thumbs, uh, genetically. <clears throat> but he also has a bleeding problem. When he bruises, those bruises don't heal. <clears throat> and so we used our sophisticated genetic techniques to determine that he has a problem with the formation of a certain modified sugar called dermatan sulfate. It's really a sulfotransferase. And what this means, and it turns out that the dermatan sulfate that he fails to make is important for this healing process. And so we are now interested in trying to provide for him dermatan sulfate. Well, these are all examples of rare diseases, just three of them. But it turns out that there are over 6,000 rare diseases. And these affect up to 25 million Americans. They are defined by law as disorders that affect fewer than 200,000 each. But together, they affect a, a whole a large number. And it turns out that there are only a few hundred treatments for these. Rare disease treatments are difficult to come by. Why? Because it's not profitable for pharmaceutical companies <clears throat> to invest in a disorder that involves only 20 people, or 50 people, or even uh, 500 people. So it falls upon the National Institutes of Health and upon physician investigators to pursue treatments for this. <clears throat> and now I'm going to tell you something that you might find impossible to believe. We have potential treatments that make sense, that have presumably very few side effects, and yet we're not allowed to use them. And why is that? It turns out that the Food and Drug Administration ensures the safety of our foods and of, our, of the drugs that come to us. And they do a wonderful job of this. But there is one issue. For rare diseases, they apply the same criteria for the use of a, an investigational drug as they do for common diseases. In fact, the dictum of the Food and Drug Administration when investigational new drugs come before them is that people with rare diseases deserve the same protection as other human subjects. Now, when you apply to the Food and Drug Administration to use an investigational drug. It's called an IND, Investigational New Drug Application. <clears throat> and the FDA requires that animal studies be done, a lot of toxicity studies, et cetera, et cetera. And this is very expensive, so much so that the drug companies don't really pursue it. Now, I would propose that instead, one should use the paradigm of risk versus benefit, especially since the risk of not treating some individuals with rare diseases is sometimes a certain death. And this is an accepted uh, ethical principle. So let me tell you about some examples of how <clears throat> the system used to work. When cysteamine, remember that drug for cystinosis, 
was approved in 1994, there were no animal studies required of it. In other words, the FDA used its discretion. And look at the scores of individuals who are, whose lives were saved by that and uh, positively affected by that. On the other hand, here's Canavan disease. <clears throat> this is a neurodegenerative disorder in which the central nervous system does not function and the kids die in, usually in the first three or four years of life. And what I'm showing you here is a nerve. And if you think of a nerve as a copper wire that's supposed to transmit impulses, it has insulation on the outside. And if you cut that in cross section, you'll see the insulation here and then the nerve in the center. The insulation is made up of myelin, and myelin is made up of acetate. And these individuals have a genetic defect in the, inabil the inability to uh, produce uh, acetate. So they can't make myelin, they have uh, lack of myelination, and that's why they have neurological deficits. So we wanted to give glyceryl triacetate as a source of acetate. And we had a little girl who was born in July of 2007. We thought we had a window of time of about 12 weeks or so uh, to treat this uh, little girl. We got the glyceryl triacetate from a company called Cognis. They donated a 50-gallon drum. We got the nurses ready for this. We submitted investigational uh, new drug exemption to the FDA, and we got uh, institutional review board approval for this protocol. And in the end, the FDA wrote to us, you need to conduct the following chronic toxicity studies and provide full reports for our review and evaluation. Six-month oral toxicity study in a rodent species, nine-month oral toxicity study in a non-rodent species. These studies should be conducted in neonatal animals to match the age groups of the patients to be enrolled in the proposed clinical study. And there were three pages of other requirements. We could request a single patient exemption but at one-tenth of the dose previously used in humans. We didn't have those data. So we told the mother, and she thanked us for our attempt, and the disease took its course. <clears throat> now let me tell you about uh, Piper. Piper has Lay's encephalopathy, another neurodegenerative disorder, due to many different genetic dis de defects pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency, pyruvate carboxylase deficiency, cytochrome C oxidase deficiency, et cetera. There was a protocol to treat individuals with Lay's encephalopathy with a particular drug made by Edison Pharmaceuticals. But that protocol required that there be a genetic cause known for anyone who um, had Lay's encephalopathy and wanted to use the drug. In this case, Piper didn't have that. And, uh, <clears throat> but, there was a physician named Dr. Greg Enns in Stanford who submitted an emergency IND to the FDA. And in addition, the drug company asked for a special exemption for Piper. The result was, in the words of Piper's mom, there were no exceptions and we just had to watch her die. So at the memorial service, which was two weeks ago today, the mom sent an invitation, and at, in the invitation, she wrote, God saw you getting tired when a cure was not to be, so he put his arms around you, and he whispered, come to me. So keep your arms around her, Lord, and give her special care. Make up for all the moments when life seemed so unfair. So many times I needed you, so many times I cried. If love could have saved you, you would have never died. Well, what's the solution to this? It turns out that the Food and Drug Administration has the opportunity to use discretion in these regards. They actually did so recently with respect to the drug Makina or whatever it was for premature pregnancy. They have that capacity. We, we need for them to use it. And we need to, for the Food and Drug Administration regulators to look at this as a risk to benefit ratio, which again is an ethical principle that we've all adhered to for the last like 50 years or so. And the risk for these individuals is sometimes certain death. You know, people in the rare disease community want to be protected, but they don't want to be protected to death. And who can address this? Well, it turns out that there are officials within the government that are addressing this issue. In particular, the NIH FDA Leadership Council with Dr. Francis Collins and Dr. Peggy Homburg, 
Know that this is an issue and are addressing it. The Society for Inherited Metabolic Disorders is the group of experts in rare diseases who care for these patients, and they have offered expertise to the Food and Drug Administration over these particular investigational new drug uh, applications. The Health Resources and, and Services Administration is going to have a hearing on this in May, and there's a URL here to which uh, you can really uh, address your comments. And finally, I would ask all of you, and why do I ask all of you? Because all of you are really affected by this. Every one of you must have a friend or an acquaintance or a family member who has a rare disease. When the bell tolls for Piper, it tolls for all of us. So, <clears throat> so I would ask you today to do some certain things. Uh, one, if you can, write your newspapers over this. Another, if you're in healthcare policy, uh, consider pursuing this as a project. You can uh, submit your comments to the uh, HRSA website. But most of all, help us with this. I don't have the answer, but you're all smart people. You might have answers. I'd ask you to uh, offer your suggestions so that, um, so that when you're asked the question, <clears throat> what would you do if you were asked to, um, to find a cure for a fatal disease? Just think about the patients that I've mentioned today. Thank you. Thank you.